There are computer parts all over my desk. In fact, there's eight 10 terabyte drives. I think we're going to build a storage server. Q intro. All right, I don't have one of those cool intros yet. I haven't bothered to make one. But let's get right into the meat of this. This is Vertical Scale Media. And normally on this channel, I am producing film, video content, narratives, commercials, uh, anything in the creative arts with a camera. However, all that stuff takes up space. Today, I'm going to show some of my IT roots here and talk about how to build your own storage server, rather inexpensive. Everything on the table here you see is less than 3,000. And that is as of September 16th, 2020. Prices in computer stuff always fall, so you can be able to get the stuff even cheaper uh, later on. However, though, we are going to have a storage server with eight 10 terabyte drives in here, providing about 60 terabytes of space uh, usable when, we get, when we're all done with this. Now, if you do the math on there and you see that um, we have eight times 10, that does not equal 60. We're gonna lose two drives to parity. And that's so we can withstand a, a drive failure and not lose all of our data. But let's get out of the technical here and let's jump into some of the, the nitty gritty on this. I've been working with Linux since 1993 and professionally for over 20 years. We're going to build this system in two different configurations and I'm gonna have the video indexed so you can jump ahead if you want to. We're gonna go through the server build here, why I chose some of this stuff. Then we're gonna talk about doing this with a awesome package called FreeNAS, uh, Free Network Attached Storage. Uh, that is probably the closest thing you can get uh, with more power than a Synology or a QNAP or one of the other um, many new drive enclosures that you can just slap on your desk and have a lot of storage available on your network very quickly. Uh, those are great devices if you just want to plug it in and go and not have to worry about too much. If you want to tinker a little bit more and get some more flexibility on what you can do, especially when you start getting the large capacity like this, even less cost, FreeNAS is a great solution. Personally, being a Linux guy, I'm not going to run FreeNAS. Uh, this system will get reloaded with CentOS 8, and I'm going to show how to do that as well and get that configured. There's a couple more configuration things that we can do with that to take advantage of these M2 PCIe devices I have here uh, that we can't do with the FreeNAS package just because of the way everything's structured. For me, that's how I'm going to run it. But I'm going to show both. I'm going to show how to do it with FreeNAS, and I'm going to show how to do this with Linux. Specifically, we're going to do this with CentOS 8. But any modern Linux that can run the ZFS package on it should be capable of doing what we're going to show today. The reason I chose some of this hardware, let's go through this here. Everything like I said is less than 3000 at the time I purchased here. We have a chassis that I got that not only has good amount of airflow through it, but it actually has eight three and a half inch drive bays built right into it. So we don't have to worry about doing adapters for five and a quarter inch drives. Everything's right here that we're going to need for the hard drives. I picked up two M2 PCIe devices. Now the reason I did this is one, I want these drives, the spinning disks, to be used just for the storage array. The other reason is that one of them is gonna be booting the OS and the other one is gonna be uh, cached in the FreeNAS setup. In the CentOS setup though, we're gonna do it a little bit differently. We have a little bit more power and control on there, so we're actually gonna split these drives up because this motherboard, and the reason I chose this board is that it can support two of these at one time. We're going to split it up so that the OS is definitely on one, but we're going to do a mirror uh, zill or slog on it, which is a um, essentially a write cache, but don't confuse it with a traditional write cache. It's only for specific synchronous operations. So we're going to do the zill on these as a mirror. You want to have that protected. You don't want to have it as, as a single drive. But that doesn't have to be very big, and as you can see, these are 512 gig drives or was it 512? 500 gig drives, close enough. We're also gonna use the remaining space on this as read cache. So that can definitely help out in performance too, depending on what you're doing and what you're working on. Having all this available on solid state drives will be uh, very fast. Memory was actually pretty cheap. So I did 32 gig rather than 16, just because it wasn't that much of a cost difference and file systems will take advantage of this as well for caching. I will also be running some virtual machines in my setup on this uh, for other devices that I want to do being a computer guy, so that memory comes in handy for that. Best bang for the buck as far as performance and cost is the AMD 5 2600. One thing not pictured on this table is because it's actually in my existing server, I just upgraded all that, made sure my cabling was all good, uh, is a 10 gig network cards. So we're going to have a pair of 10 gig uh, PCIe network cards 
one in my desktop, which is my primary connection to this, even though this will be available on the network as a whole, uh, and then one in the server too. So we will have 10 gig connection between here and the desktop uh, for all the video editing. So we should have really good speeds network-wise between this, and then depending on what we can get out of these spinning disks, we will probably have some pretty good performance to edit over the NAS rather than having to have things locally attached to the desktop. Finally, the motherboard. The reason I chose this motherboard was that this motherboard by itself supports two PCI Express devices, which is kind of rare. The other thing that this motherboard has on it was eight SATA uh, connections built right on. So no, no need for an additional HBA post bus adapter um, to run all these drives. So that's my reason for choosing what I chose. Uh, I'm also recycling a power supply I have, but even with having to buy like the 1X PCI Express video card and buying a power supply, you still come in right around 3K for this entire setup, and that is including the two network cards to um, put in here and in the, the end of the server, or sorry, into your desktop to get 10 gig connections between everything. So let's get um, putting this together, and then I will do the free NAS one first, demo how to do that, show the configurations, how to get that all up and attached, and then I will also show the CentOS 8 installation. Now, obviously, these are going to be pretty basic setups for how to get this done. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the intricate details of how I would do all my setup and tuning. It's just to get you up and running and get you up running and quickly. Definitely look at the documentation for either direction you go. If you have no idea about Linux, don't do that option. Do the free NAS option. That is the easiest way for sure to get up and running on a stable, reliable platform. But let's jump in. So the first thing we're going to do here is just mount these. What I liked about this caddy here, let me check my overhead, yep. What I liked about this caddy here was that it's toolless. You just kind of pry the edges apart a little bit. There's little pins that line up where the screw holes normally would go. And they're on little rubber mounts, which is kind of cool. Gerald Undone did an excellent video where he built an Aurora system from Gigabyte. And that was an excellent walkthrough of him building his new desktop workstation. Look what we have in here. Hmm. Eight SATA drives, and they give you two cables. Not very optimistic about what you might be doing with the system, huh? These are not normal screws. I don't know if you can see that or not. Not sure what these are for. Guess I'll find out on that one. Let's pop this backplate on here. Oh, that's what those screws are for. I think those are for the M2 device. Yeah, this looks like a standoff and standoff and a screw to screw it down. Problem with this though is that this is not a standard Phillips number two. So be right back. Take this back out. All right, first one's in, now the next one. For some reason, that one has a heat sink. All right, this one on the back of it here has removed this sticky stuff. All right, that's a snug, snug fit there. It is right up against that PCI 1X slot. And 1B. Guess we'll find out when we turn it on if that was correct. Did I put the sticker on my case? Now this is a lot of little pins. You want to make sure that when you line these up, you line it up so it's right. There's the arrow that's on the board. 
and that is the arrow here. And you can also tell this one's a square corner. The rest of them are diagonal corners. And you can see here, this is a square corner as well. True story. When I was very young, I was at a computer store working in the back room. We had this lady that came in and was applying to be one of our techs. She couldn't figure out how to get that CPU in there. It just wouldn't line up. So she actually did this. She's like, anyone looking? Wham! Smacked it in there. Well, the boss saw it. And uh, when it came time for lunch, he told her not to come back. So they do line up. And there's a reason that they fit in there a certain way. So that's in there. Let's put the fan on. This one does not require these little brackets to be there. So we're going to take those brackets off. But make sure you save those brackets because if you ever decide to upgrade this or change something out, you're going to need these depending on the style of fan that you may end up with. Now, depending on the style of the motherboard, the back side of this that's, that these things thread into may actually just be loose and it requires the tension of the screws to actually hold that on. So I would advise just to leave the board alone, not to pick it up because that, that might pop, and then just screw this in there. I like to, now well, these are actually, it's too fat of a screwdriver. You know, thinner shaft to get down into this. I like to go corner to corner, and it's a little bit of the time, so we get equal pressure on the CPU. Okay, that one's tight. That one's tight. That one's tight. That one's tight. All right, you might want to find it's a CPU fan there, a CPU fan optional. So put it in the one for the CPU. If you care about any kind of the monitoring that might be present in the motherboard uh, bias for that, then you'll want to make sure it's plugged in the right spot so you can keep track of it. And also cycle the fan if you use intelligent fan uh, functions in there. Make sure you can cycle that properly too. Time to put the board in the case. All right, I could do a visual here. We have one screw, two screw. There is not one up here. It needs one. Those two are present, and the third one it can use. And those two are present, also a third one it can use. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine holes on this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'd like to make sure there's no other standoffs that I might be missing. Because you really don't want to have your motherboard ground out, and then you ruin your motherboard. Ooh, zip ties. Second only to duct tape and holding everything together. Yep, there's a standoff. There's a standoff. Should be one more standoff. There it is. Bare minimum of standoffs. They didn't give you a whole lot extra here. Time for motherboard insertion. All right, they're fine threads. It's a little unusual. All right, I like to go through here and get them all started so they all line up perfectly and then go back through and tighten them down. Also, the note, one thing I thought was a little odd, the back corner screw here. There you go, one way back here. That screw was a coarse thread, not a fine thread. All the rest were fine. I don't know why they did that. It was not one of the ones I put in there that was already existing. So they had one that was coarse. So if we look at the back of this, let's pop this. We can get to all the drives and then we can run the cables here and then run them down in, inside. So I will go ahead and cable the rest of this up. 
If you were to use one kind of cool feature here, if you want to use some SSD drives as well, two and a half inch, there's two more spots back here for those. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility with this case for how many things you want to plug into it. So I'll get a little stuff uh, wrangled up here and then we'll jump to a power on and then I'll go through the loads. We'll do free NAS, like I said, and then we'll finish up with SunOS 8. Thanks for sticking with us so far and uh, stay tuned. I'm going to call it quits for the night though, because uh, it's going to take a little while to do the rest of this and I'll just film tomorrow. So. You'll see like two seconds pass. For me, it'll be 22 hours or so. Oh, yeah, one more thing. Let's see, while we have this open here, here's the case and three big fans. And there's this little mesh grill here to help with dirt and dust intake. So, I like the design of this case. I think it'll be good for, good for the file server. Alright, sayonara. Alright, welcome back to the free NAS portion of this. So we have the machine assembled here now and we have just booted it up. So you can see here on the BIOS screen, um, we have a blank BIOS. So we're going to go in here and we can configure this a little bit. There's a few things I like to change on here. Um, when you first turn this on, it's going to tell you that the BIOS is not configured, but if it doesn't, you can continue to hit the delete key to get into the BIOS. Either way though, it's told us here that it can't continue without us setting it up, so we're going to hit F1 to go into the BIOS. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to turn off this stupid interface, because we're setting up a storage array, not a gaming platform. We want data, not pretty graphics. So, went into advanced settings here. We're just going to go down the list and change things that need to get changed. Um, the time there looks like it's in UTC time, which is correct. Security, everything's fine there. We're going to go over all this AI tweaker. We're going to leave us alone. We don't want to overclock this thing. We don't want to mess with RAM timings. Everything if you bought on the list that I had should be sufficient for this machine. Uh, if you want something else in the machine, um, and you don't want to use uh, some of the hardware that I have, then go ahead and feel free to change these if you need to. But I would leave all these alone um, for this tweaker stuff here because we want the stable machine. We don't want it to be pushing every little bit of speed it can out of this. So go into advanced. We don't have anything to do here with the TPM device, CPU configuration. We do want to turn on SVM mode. Um, that is in case you want to do some virtual machines, which both the SunOS version and the FreeNAS version do support. So we will uh, turn that on just in case you desire to do that. I desire to do that with mine, so it will be turned on for that. Uh, under the configuration for SATA, we are going to leave everything here alone. This comes up default uh, as it should for everything that's configured here. Onboard device configuration, this can all be stay um, the same as well. All default. We want to make sure that our, at least for me, I'm going to be booting off Pixie Boot. Uh, if you're booting off USB thumbstick or you're going to attach a DVD drive to it, you can turn, you can leave this alone. But for me, I'm going to turn this on because we're going to be Pixie Booting. Uh, there, no need for a serial port. Go ahead and you can disable this. Free up that resource from being uh, consumed by the machine. I like to have my file servers always on. So if we have power loss and power comes back, power on. Um, you should have your storage array, especially one this large uh, that has critical data on it, uh, backed up with a UPS. So you should not be experiencing a power loss if that's all properly configured. SRIOV, you can turn this on too. This is uh, part of virtualization. I'm not sure if you're going to need that or not um, for what you may want to do with it, but it doesn't hurt to have it on. Everything else here is default. This is all timing as well. That's all going to be default. This is the monitor for the fans. You can have an alert on fans if you want to have things uh, checked for speed. This particular system really only has a CPU and the motherboard fan. There's not much else it can actually control. Uh, because those fans are actually 5 volt fans and 12 volt fans off of the actual power supply rails, not off their motherboard headers. 
We go into boot, boot configuration. I turn off fast boot. I want to go ahead and do an actual mem test, at least a quick one. I don't care about this logo again. Again, we, we are setting up a server here, not a gaming machine. And setup mode is which mode do you want to go into when you first uh, boot up the BIOS? This mode that we're currently in, or do you want to go back into the pretty graphic mode? And I'd rather have it go back into advance if you go back into it. Uh, also to note, I have um, the USB stick plugged in currently as I'm going through this here. And there's a reason for that. We need to make sure that we can boot off that device. So see here, boot options. We're going to do this gen general U-Disk 5.0. That is my USB stick. Yours might be called something different, but that should be the first one to boot off of for the FreeNAS installation. If you follow the FreeNAS's guide and put it on a USB stick, that is the easiest in my opinion. So you should probably go ahead and follow that follow suit with that as well. So now we wait. All right, so it sees everything there as it should. It should boot up on the USB stick here. Yep, it is. So it's going to ask us, what do you want to do? We want to install FreeNAS. So hit one. And through the power of editing, you don't have to wait for all this. I'll be fast forwarding through some of it here. All right, we're going to install an upgrade. So hit enter. We're only going to select one of the NVMe devices here. Now this is one of the things that you have a little bit more flexibility with when you do it with CentOS. Um, or any other type of Linux that you can do by hand for, NF for a ZFS file system. But here using FreeNAS, it's a little less uh, flexible. So we're gonna just choose one of these devices. We're gonna hit okay. We're gonna perform a fresh install. We're going to format the boot device. Yes, and we're gonna go to password, test. And we are going to boot via BIOS. We uh, have no need to boot with UEFI with this hardware. In fact, I can't boot with UEFI with the video card that I have selected out of my old stock of video cards that I had laying around. But there's no benefit to booting UEFI with this. So if you can boot via BIOS, boot via BIOS. You may only have one option available depending on what other hardware you may have inside the system. A uh, different video card may affect that. We don't need a swap. All right, and now we wait for it to copy the configuration onto the drive. I wonder how much time over my IT career I have sat and waited and watched and waited. Oftentimes to be let down when something didn't work right and have to start the whole process again. Maybe the machines already own us. Sitting here, waiting. That's a lot better than my first time installing Slackware back in 93. I had the X video system back then too, X GUI. Not X free, but X. And that was not fun to set up. Hey, we're successful. So hit enter and then we can reboot and pull off that USB stick. All right, it sees the devices. USB is missing now. Again, if you don't have Pixie turned on, you won't see these messages, but if you do, you can hit escape unless you want to boot Pixie for some reason. But we want to boot off that NVMe we just installed onto. Yep, there it goes, starting to boot. And we want to boot FreeNAS. Go ahead and hit enter. Or the number one. Two roads that lead to the same place. See, as a YouTuber who is making this kind of stuff, you get to sit here and wait and watch. Kind of play along a little bit with your late night radio DJ voice. Something to keep yourself entertained while you're waiting. 
could watch that Gerald Undone review of his Aorus system that he built. I do have multiple monitors. All right, this is a lie. This is not going to take a long time. It may have, if you would have installed this on like a Pentium 2. Eh, I'd call that a medium amount of time. All right, so the first time around here, it'll pause for a little bit and wait to bring up the 10 gig link, which is the IX0. It's looking for a DHCP address on that link. And in my configuration, it is plugged directly into my desktop editing machine. My desktop is not running a DHCP server. So it'll eventually time out with that. All right, just about finished here. Hey, now we go, okay. So, um, for the most part, you're not gonna touch the, touch the keyboard anymore on this system. Once you put it in place where it's gonna be, you're gonna leave it alone. But you can see here that the web interface picked up a DHCP off of my router. My home network is 192.168.3. Yours is more than likely 192.168.1. Uh, if you are the vast majority of people out there who have a home router from your internet provider or just a crappy little Linksys you plugged in. Go ahead and open up Chrome, Firefox, whatever you want to use, hopefully not IE, and browse to this off of your desktop. All right, we are to the login prompt now. So we're gonna log in with our username of root and test was our really crappy password. All right, so first thing we gotta configure here is the network. Now I'm gonna assume that you've already configured the network in your Windows or Mac or other Linux system that you have that you're gonna to connect to this NAS device. So for the purposes of this, um, the desktop's already configured. I'm going to set up this 10 gig network uh, interface here um, with another range that I already have assigned. Um, the interface on the Realtek is 192.168.3.222 and the 192.168.3 is the network that I have on my router at home. So it pulled a DHCP address for that. You may want to leave it at DHCP, you may want to um, assign an aesthetic address. Either way though, there is a bug in the interface here where we configure this and we go to configure when you turn off DHCP, it turns off DHCP for both interfaces, which is not what we want. Um, so I, my desktop is configured for 4.2. We're gonna configure this as 4.1, hit apply. And it's gonna say we have to change these, uh, test these changes. So we hit test, confirm, test. Now we lose connection because it just dropped the interface off of the Realtek. So now we gotta browse to 4.1 in the web browser. Advanced, connect. Flop back in again, test, and we're gonna save networking. So now we have an address here on our 10 gig link. We don't have one over here on the Realtek. So we go back into this, and for simplicity, we can set this back to DHCP. Um, it is a bug. If you set this to DHCP, it will set it here, but not on the other one, which is what we wanted the first time around, but unchecking it off of the 10 gig, unchecked it off of both bug with the installer. We're gonna go ahead and just set it to the address that it was given, 3.222. We're gonna apply that. We're gonna test changes, confirm, test changes. Now, we didn't have to reconnect anything because nothing went down this time. Um, now, on your 10 gig link, it is advised that you configure jumbo frames, which is your MTU. I have on my desktop uh, configured jumbo frames, so I'm gonna go ahead and set that on this. Um, if you have not done that, don't set that option because it will cause problems with your network. All right, so we have that configured. Let's go configure storage. So we're gonna go to storage, we're gonna go to pools. There are no pools currently. So I'm gonna add, create pool. We're gonna select all the disks except for the last NVMe device here. <clears throat> I'm gonna call my pool storage and Add those here it's going to default to raid z2 which is essentially raid 6 we're going to lose two drives worth of parity data roughly um, to stretch across all this that means that we can lose roughly two drives in the array and not have catastrophic data loss we're also going to add this nvme as a cache drive 
So now we have a RAID Z2, which is these drives, and we have one cache drive. And we're going to go ahead and create. Confirm, create pool. All right, so you have one storage volume here, a data set, um, roughly 50 terabytes of space, which is kind of a bummer that it is slimmed down like that when we um, have 80 terabytes of space in this thing. But that is what happens after you format it and after you lose two drives to parity. So let's go to edit options here. You can see it's storage, LZ4. Everything looks good. LZ4 is recommended um, for performance reasons. And it does save some space as well on rare instances, but doesn't really hurt your processor at all. So definitely turn that on or leave that alone, I should say. We're going to add a data set now. And we're going to call this one homes for the home directories. Actually, we're going to call it home, home directories. We're going to save this. And then we're all going to add another data set. And I'm going to call this one vol1. It is advised that you don't share the root because you can't change ACL permissions on the root. Um, but adding a sub-volume off of the root, which our root of storage, allows us to actually set ACLs and give users access to this for Samba, NFS, or other things like that easily through FreeNAS. So those are all set. So now we are going to go to Accounts, Users, and we're going to create a new user. And we're going to create Bob. And Bob has the dumbest password in the world. It is test, similar to our root user. We're going to say his home directory is in home. And he has a Microsoft account. This will allow him to actually share from the Windows PC. So we have that all set up. Everything looks good. Hit save. So Bob has a home directory now. Now we can go to sharing and go to Windows shares. And we're going to add a share. And we are going to share vol1. Hit save. It's going to ask if you want to enable this service. Yes, I do. Samba has been enabled. Do you want to configure the ACL now? Yes, we want to enable that. And it asks that twice. I don't know why. It thinks it has to ask that again. We're going to configure ACL. Bob open at ACL. User and the user is Bob. Permission is full control. Save. There's our vol1. I'm going to map the network drive and you can choose reconnect at login. Let's do it as Z. Finish. There is the Z folder. And if you go to this PC, See, there is Z, 50 terabytes free. And for fun, I am going to grab some stuff to copy over there. All right, so that is the conclusion to the FreeNAS portion of this. There's a lot of other options in FreeNAS. There's a lot of things to configure in there. But this is the nitty gritty to get this hardware up and running with FreeNAS and have local storage available to your desktop at 10 gig and to your network at large over your other 1 gig link. So the next part is doing this with SunOS. Welcome to the SunOS portion of configuring your new uh, network attached storage device. This tutorial here, I am pixie booting this off the network. More than likely though, you'll probably be installing from USB or uh, DVD. All right, so depending on where you're at, you're gonna choose English, continue. A lot of this is pretty straightforward here. If you've configured a Linux system before, it'll be pretty simple. This tutorial does uh, assume some knowledge of how the stuff works. So I'm not gonna explain a whole lot in here. I am going to choose, uh, I don't wanna serve with a GUI. I think a GUI on the server is <clears throat> absolutely useless. So we are going to do regular old server. Now you can do basic install and just install the packages that you want. Sometimes that's really annoying. So we're just gonna go ahead and configure the storage array. And I'm not gonna walk through all the intricacies of setting up NFS, Samba, and everything else. If you are in this portion of the tutorial, you, I assume you know those things. 
However, I am going to walk through some of the unique settings that I will use for ZFS when we do this, just so uh, we can talk, of, talk about what was different between this and FreeNAS and how to get a little bit more performance out of this setup um, doing it on a CentOS 8 system. All right, and I am going to go to my disks here and you will see that I have a lot of different disks. So we're gonna just play with this first one and we're gonna do a custom layout on it. I do not like using LVM. Uh, I like standard partitions unless there's a call for it. So what I'm going to do here is just do a standard partition. We're going to do our boot. One gig is sufficient for boot. EXT4, I like to give these labels. And then we're going to also add our root file system. And my belief on root file systems is that they should be fairly minimal. It's enough to hold the OS, it's enough to hold um, maybe some temp files that would be put on there and logs. Everything else should be somewhere else. That way, if you need to wipe and reload your installation if something happens to it, you get somebody who compromises your box, you have a single point here to get rid of all your system binaries on the system and not have to worry about moving data around before you can just nuke that entire partition. So we have a boot and a root, this is all that's needed here. Um, again, change this back to ext4, we're going to call this one root, update settings, and that is it for this. Now it's going to tell down here in the bottom, it's going to pop up and say, you don't have a swap, I don't care about that, accept changes, you notice I also disabled kdump here, we don't care about that either, again installation, and my root user is going to have the lamest password in the world, which is test. It's going to warn us, we got to click on it twice, and now we wait for the packages to install. At least I wait, you don't wait. I'm going to fast forward through all of this for you, because I love you guys. I can't fast forward through this though, does that mean I hate myself? Alright, installation is complete, go ahead and click on reboot. Rebooting. All right, so here's my system that's all booted up. I'm gonna log in. All right, we've logged in. So now we get to have the fun. You see our two partitions we made here before. So we're gonna make a part, make two more of them here. We're gonna do a primary. Doesn't matter what file system type. Uh, we're gonna start this at the end of the other one. So 22.5 gig. And we're gonna have this end at approximately 15 gig ahead of this, 30. 7.5 gig. So we got 15 gig partition. Then we're going to do make part primary. This one's going to start at 37.5 gig and we're going to make it 100%. So those are two partitions there. And we're going to do the same thing to the other NVMe. However, as you'll know here, we're going to make the label MS DOS so it, it is the same as the other one. Now there's no partitions on this drive, so we're going to do a make part, we're going to do the primary. We're going to start this one at starting point of one, and it's going to be 15 gig. And then we're going to do another make part, primary. This one's going to start at 15 gig and be 100%. Now we have two of them here, and the other one we have four. Now one downside is that um, we can't really do a mirror or a raid for our root and our boot inside of uh, send OS with this. Without doing a lot of other trickery, this is not worth it. Um, and the motherboard doesn't support it really either. The fake RAID that it uses is not a true RAID. But we can, what we, what we can do here that we can't do with FreeNAS, is that we can configure a ZIL or a SLOG, which is the ZFS intent log. This adds a level of synchronous write cache to the array that we did not have the ability to create with the FreeNAS. Now, you could have used the spare uh, M2 device as just a, a ZIL slog device. That's not advisable though, because you really want to have that mirrored. If you end up losing um, your ZIL, uh, you'll have data corruption. You can have data corruption. So it's a good idea to mirror that. So that is why we have two partitions um, that are identical on both systems. We have the 22, or sorry, we have the 15 gig on first NVMe and you have the 15 gig on the second NVMe. 
Um, the rest of the space we're going to use as the L2 Arc, which is the level 2 adaptive read cache. Now we use the entire M2 in the FreeNAS setup of that secondary M2 as just the cache. Um, here we're going to add both of them as cache because we don't need to have um, all that other space wasted as, as a root file system. So to make this easier, we're going to switch over and we're going to SSH into this rather than continuing on the console. Let's go to the ZFS on Linux. We're going to go to the CentOS one here. We're going to grab this package, copy that, do a yum install on this package. Now, unlike the FreeNAS one, uh, I assume a little bit more expertise with this install. You're on your own for configuring networking, configuring Samba, configuring NFS, or any other functionality, VM, hypervisors, on this box um, versus the FreeNAS one, which I walked a little bit more through. So we're going to focus just purely on getting ZFS on here. So I now have the ZFS package on here. We need to edit, though, um, the yum repo file. All right, so there's a new one here called repo. Now we're gonna disable the DKMIS version, DKMS version. We're gonna do the KMOD version. This is recommended per the docs on the OpenZFS project. As you can see here, it talks about turning on the KABI module rather than DKMS. So now we can just do a yum install ZFS. Yes. All right. Mod probe ZFS, get the module going. All right. ZFS status. Oops. All right. Z pool status. No pools available. So. One thing that I would advise you to do, um, this is also in the documentation as well, is rather than using SDA, SDB, STC, which can change, better to use the WWN, which is the worldwide name, which is a, a unique global identifier for the device. So we're going to use that when we create our zpool instead. So we're going to create our zpool. So zpool create. Now this is the first option we're going to set here, which is a shift equals 12. Now this is the option to set your uh, devices as a 4K device. So as best I can tell, even though that the drives are exported as a 512 emulated, it is still better to consider them as a 4K drive because they're 4K native. And the way that 512 emulation works is it's still a read copy write if you write something less than 4K blocks. So if we can write 4K at a time, we don't have to worry about uh, a read copy write operation happening in the, on the sectors at the low level. All right, so rather than using the device names, we're gonna use the WWNs. I have those down here already. Hit enter. And we need to force creation on this. This is because part of the tutorial before this was doing it with FreeNAS. So it thinks those might be part of an act of value. So now if we do zpool status, there is our RAID Z2 device. And if we do zpool list, we'll see that we have 72 terabytes of raw space. Um, those drives were slightly more than nine terabytes. It's a shame that they do the storage like this now. 10 terabyte drive, but it used to be 1024 was a byte. Now it's 1000 even as a byte. So it actually shaves off quite a bit of storage. <clears throat> so those 10 terabyte drives end up being something more than nine. Got eight of them in there. Eight times nine is 72. And then we're gonna lose a surprising amount of storage. To parity, 51. That really stinks, but at least we'll have a pretty safe array here. So we've added these drives and we have our pool under storage. Now the other thing we want to do is we want to add our mirror device. All right, now if we do a Z pool status, 
You see we have the, the slogs there, also known as the zill. That's a mirror between those two partitions. And the last we're gonna do is we're gonna do a zpool add to storage cache. And here we're going to grab the last partition on the first NVMe and the last partition on the second NVMe. And there's our status for that. So now we have cache and a slog device. So we should have a fairly fast uh, storage array that we were not able to create quite this way with FreeNAS. Now you may have been able to use a shell on FreeNAS and actually shell out and make some of these commands on your own, but the web interface is not set up to, set, to design a ZFS pool this way. Um, again, don't share the root system out like this. You can if you really want to. Um, it's a little bit more free to do this on SunOS than it is on the FreeNAS device. I still highly recommend that you create um, data sets underneath this and export those out via your whatever method you're going to share those and not actually the root of the pool. Other things too that we can set on this volume is compression. I highly recommend you do not use deduplication on ZFS. It's not worth it for the amount of overhead that you have with RAM and this general speed. But there you have it. CentOS and how to do ZFS on your CentOS pool. So thank you for sticking with me on this build of this very large and inexpensive network attached storage. Uh, 10 gigabit network interface uh, back to the desktop. And at the end of it, um, roughly 50 terabytes of usable redundant parity data. So that is hard to shake a big stick at. I don't have any sticks in my, my YouTube area here. But I'd shake it if I had one. Um, but this build is not official until we apply the sticker. So, sticker has been healed. Let's see how not square I can get this to line up down here at the bottom. Ooh, that's a toughie. There we go. All right, now it's official. So get out there and get creating. Um, we have a lot of space now to be able to store all of our video and our footage. And um, hopefully, like I said, you found this beneficial. I'd love some comments and know what you guys have to say about this, um, especially if you have some experience doing this as well. I've been doing Linux since 1993, but there's always new things I can learn. So I would love to know what uh, some of your experiences are, if you've done anything like this as well, and any questions you have. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Vertical Scale Media. My name is Jason, and have a great day.